There is only one person in the world that gets away with changing the order of the words. And his name is Yoda. <laughs> Yoda doesn't say, you know, may the force be with you. He says, with you, may the force be. Right? And you kind of look at him and go, okay, you're green and short, and I'm going to let you get away with that. <laughs> but don't talk to me like that when you grow up, okay? Or change color for that matter. Now, we understand, with you, may the force be. But for some bizarre reason, it sounds more archaic, more ancient, more, like wiser. Otherwise, Yoda wouldn't talk that way, right? And the reason is that that kind of unfixed word order was very common before the whole clipping process occurred. And therefore, it, it reminds us of, of an ancient time in which word order was not fixed. But today, except if you're an artist, of course, and you're trying to use a, a, a changed word order on purpose for an effect, the majority of people stick to the fixed word order. When the Normans were defeated in battle after 200 years, and all the French-speaking aristocrats and ecclesiastical authorities were kicked out of England, the new rulers looked at the language that the masses were speaking, and it was a different language. It was, it, it, it was uh, old English, or rather, it had, I'm sorry, it had made a transition from old English to early Middle English. He still had a long way to go before he became English, the English we speak today, but nevertheless, he was not German anymore. The linguistic matter itself had been worked over by those palates, by those teeth, by those lips, and, he had, and the inflections had been literally eroded away, as if it was a material thing. So this type of history, is what Deleuze and Gattari want us to think about. They, um, this, two particular examples don't happen to be in the history of linguistics, but they want us to think about it because it's only by thinking about the history of language this way that then we begin to conceive of all languages, even today, as heterogeneous, as having sources of variation that fight the standardization of the standard, I mean the homogenization of the standard. The standards, as I said at the beginning of the talk, were created in specific organizations. The Toscan Academy of Language is created in the, uh, in the 1600s. I'm unfortunately cannot remember the exact dates right now, but it is 1638. The French Academy of Language is created in the early 1700s. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm getting my, my dates wrong. I'm, I'm going I'm to start all over again. 1494, Antonio de Nebrija. And here's for you to tell me there, uh, Heinrich. You did, it, you did it once already. Find me those dates, huh? <laughs> Please. <laughs> Antonio de Nebrija, in 1492, what am I talking about? 1492, of course, is the year where Columbus offers the Queen of Spain the project of discovering a new route to the Indies. You know, the Portuguese already broke the monopoly that the Venetians and the Genoese had of trading with the Levant by going up around Africa, and they're making tons and tons and tons of money out of that cinnamon, out of that sugar, out of those spices they're bringing from, from, from the Orient. So Columbus says to the Queen, I want to offer you a new project. Instead of going around Africa, let's go across the globe. He, of course, thought the globe was much smaller and had no idea he was going to stumble upon the American continent. But nevertheless, the, the Queen said, yes, this is going to extend my empire. A few weeks later, Antonio de Nebrija shows up with a book that he called Artificial Castillo, 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 which was roughly what Chomsky did in the 20th century for English, or what Saussure, or Benveniste, rather, or the followers of Saussure did for French. The grammar, just a, 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 a formal rendering of the grammatical patterns that were actually used by the upper classes in the region of Castile. He was, of course, a visionary. No one understood why anyone would want artificial Castilian. But Antonio de Nebrija knew. He dedicated the book to the queen, and, she did, and he dedicated the book to the queen as an instrument of empire. And he said to the queen, look, uh, your honor, 
uh, how do you know when you utter a command that someone in Leon or someone in, in, in Catalonia or someone in, in another place that has a different dialect understands what you're talking about? They all have their different dialects, they defend their own dialects, so how do you know they understand your commands? The best way of doing that is to create an artificial Castilian, <clears throat> artificial grammar, a, a dictionary with all the valid words, a word that's not in the dictionary is not a word of Castilian, and a, and a, and a, and a system of rules of pronunciation that also captures the pronunciation of, of, of the upper class, and then impose them on the entire population. Then you'll know that when you say, you know, follow me to war, or when you're saying, you know, anything, any command, everybody will understand what you're talking about. The queen looked at him like, what the hell? Who let this guy? Well, I mean, get the hell out of here. Kick him out. She didn't understand what Antonio de Rica was talking about. She didn't understand linguistic imperialism, if you want to put it this way, or imper linguistic colonialism. Nevertheless, even though Denebrija did not do well, I believe it's in 1582 that the Tuscan Academy of Language, and this, I'm going to put a, uh, a uh, question mark here, because I forgot to bring my dates. It was about a hundred years later, a specific organization is created, staffed with grammarians and professionals of language, to systematize Toscan, that is, the particular Italian dialect spoken in Florence and the region that Florence dominated, to create an artificial Toscan, that is, an artificial grammar for Toscan, to create a dictionary with all the valid Toscan words, and defend it roughly in the same terms. You know, it, today Dante, Boccaccio, Petrarca are writing in Toscan, but how do we know that people in the future will be able to understand these books if we let language change the way it changed after the fall of the one empire. Let's freeze it in its current form now. Let's create standard Tuscan. In the 1600s, I, I think it's 1638, but I'm not quite sure, so I'm just going to say it's early 1600s. The French Academy of Language is created. And they do the exact same thing. When you read the, uh, the records of their meetings, you know, these are all learned grammarians and learned literature professors and, and very prestigious academics staffing this institution that was, of course, had given the royal seal of approval. You see their arguments. We must freeze language now. 1635. Uh, 1635. 1635. The other figures are correct. <laughs> Do I get a prize or something? Like at least a piece of candy or something. 1635. Thank you, man. You've done this for me several times already. I owe you one. The magic of the web. Well, the point being, not the exact dates, for God's sakes. The point, being, <laughs> the point being that you need an organization, that you need an organization with the power of the state backing it up to create a standard language. Standard languages don't come into existence in a self-organized way, just like regular languages do over 200 years. The, the process of clipping a word uh, or the fixing that we just, that we just saw. But, of course, you can have all the academies of language that you want to, and all you're going to do is propagate the new standard through the upper classes and through the upper middle classes. The upper middle classes rising as they were, of course, to the commercial revolution and the incipient industrial revolution wanted to speak in the most prestigious form. They wanted to imitate those aristocrats. So they were avid buyers of dictionaries, avid buyers of grammars, avid buyers of rules of pronunciation, and they enforced them in, in, to, in, in front of their kids. No, you know, you can say ain't, you know, you have to say it this way, or, no, you cannot say this, you have to say that, because otherwise you sound vulgar. 